So when you're using the least squares method uh, to find an equation of best fit, um, what powered that whole process was linear algebra, right? The idea that we really have a vector space that the, that the family of functions that we're using to, to fit our curves to forms a vector space. And it's kind of clear in the case of the first family in this problem why that is. Um, if we're looking at F1, what would you say is a basis for this subspace of functions, the, the set of functions who have the form y equals ax squared plus b? Um, what would you say is a basis for that subspace? What functions form a basis there? This set F1 is the set of linear combinations of what functions? If it's AX squared plus B. So if we could write every function in F1 as a linear combination, so if I have a function inside of my, my space, then it's going to have the form AX squared plus B. squared plus b. Then a and b are my unknown coefficients, right? They're my c1 and my c2. Um, but what are the vectors, quote unquote vectors, which are really functions in this set? Um, what are the vectors which form a basis, the, vec the, the functions of which ax squared plus b describes the set of all their linear combinations? What functions form a basis of that space? You can tell me if this picture helps or not. But if I have a function here in my space, ax squared plus b, and I think of a and b as my coordinates, then what am I actually adding together? Or maybe another way to say this is, what are my coordinate basis vectors? If I sketch it in this way that if I multiply a by the first one and b by the second one, and then I add them together, that I end up getting ax squared plus b. a times what and b times what are being added together? x squared. And what was the second one? 1. one. Yeah, that's all there is to it. So a basis for f1 here consists of the functions, uh, let's call them f1 of x is equal to x squared, and f2 of x is equal to 1, that pair of functions forms a basis for the space f1. Because then the set of all linear combinations of x squared and 1 is exactly the set which is described by the set of all functions ax squared plus b times 1, where a and b range over all real numbers. So in the case of the first space of functions, f1, that first family, we can see that it's a vector space because we can directly find a basis for it, the basis x squared and 1. Um, by the way, what does that make the dimension of f1 over the real numbers? What is its dimension as a vector space? Yes, right. So f1 as a vector space is two-dimensional because its basis has two elements, the function x squared and the function 1. So f1 is a two-dimensional space of functions. And from that two-dimensional space of functions, we want to find the one which is closest to passing through these three points. That's essentially what you're doing when you're finding an equation of best fit using the least squares method. Um, so this was all a roundabout way of getting to Brian's question, which is we see how to do that with f1. Right, we can find a basis for it <coughs> and then use those functions, x squared and 1, to build the, uh, the system of equations, essentially, uh, that, we, um, that we end up needing to solve using the normal equation technique to find the least squared solution. But his question related not to f1 but to f2, because to do this with f2 is not as obvious. So if we look at f2 for a second instead, f2 here is a space not of quadratic functions as f1 was. 
and this space of exponential functions, it is not possible for us to directly write every one of those functions as a times one function plus b times another function, because our a's and b's are intertwined here not by linear combination, scalar multiplication and addition, but instead by multiplication and exponentiation. So it's not obvious to see, in other words, how to turn the system of equations that we would get by plugging these three points into y equals a times b to the x into a linear system that we can then use linear algebra to solve. That, that was the, the whole point of finally coming back around after five minutes. Um, so if I just plug these three points into y equals a plus b to the x, I'm going to get 0 equals a times b to the 0, and 3 equals a times b to the 1, and 7 equals a times b to the 2. And then I have to somehow solve using least squares method this system of equations. But this is not even a linear system of equations. Do you see why that is? Why, how, do, how can we tell this is not a linear system of equations? Why does linear algebra not help us with this? What's the giveaway? Yeah, too, well, it's, too, it's, it's over-specified, but that's OK for us, right? Because we can still, over-specified systems are our specialty in this class. Um, that is what projection problems were. They were overspecified systems, and that's what the normal equations helps us to solve as best we can. So it's not that it's overspecified. It's that it's not linear. And how can we tell it's not linear? We've got exponents, and we're taking the two unknowns that we have here, a and b, and our unknowns are being multiplied by one another. Right? It's like the difference between x plus y equals something and x times y equals something. The former is a linear equation. The, the latter is a nonlinear equation. You multiply your unknowns together. That's not linear. So we have to do something to this system to turn it into a linear system. Team three, the half of team three, which is here today, um, you had the example when we worked on this on Material Monday 4 uh, where you actually had to do a system like this. So what was your trick? What was your solution to turning the arithmetic operations that we don't like, this multiplication here and this exponential, um, turning those into something that looks more like a linear system? What would you do? We turned it into logarithms. Yeah. So this is the old standard trick, just like in... Um, you know, in your Calc 1 class, you had a lot of these nasty differential problems to do, these ugly derivatives. And the only way that you had to take derivatives was to take your function and use a natural log to turn what used to be exponents into multiplication and what used to be multiplication into addition. That's what logarithms are kind of designed to do. For example, this is totally a digression, but just give me a moment. If you want to find the derivative of a function like x to the x, we can't use the power rule because the exponent is a variable. We can't use the rule for exponential functions because the base is a variable. So we're stuck. We don't have a rule for how to take this derivative. So what you ended up doing was taking the natural log of both sides. And then you can say that the natural log of f is the natural log of x to the x. Well, what happens with the natural log of x to the x that makes your day a little bit better? this x can come down to the front instead because natural logs turn exponents into multiplication. You end up with x ln x. And then that's something which you know how to take a derivative of. We can use the product rule. Probably shouldn't do this whole example out, but now I can't stop myself. 1 times natural log of x plus x times 1 over x. Um, so when you do this, you end up with natural log of x plus 1, 1 plus ln of x. And then you observe that what you actually get is the derivative of ln of f. So ln of f prime is equal to 1 plus ln of x. And then in order to relate this back to f prime, you use the chain rule on the natural log of f derivative, which is f prime over f. And so if I want to know what f prime is, I just need to multiply both sides by f and find out that f of x, sorry, f prime of x, is equal to f of x times 1 plus log x. And since we know f of x is x to the x, we just fill that in. 
So we'll chalk that up to an example I probably shouldn't have done all of, but it's one of those things that's too much fun to, to stop. Um, but the point is what happened at the first step, right, where we turned exponentiation into multiplication instead. That's the same philosophy that avails us here. If I take a natural log on both sides, well, you can probably see what the problem is with taking a natural log on both sides of this particular uh, function. What's the issue? Well, first of all, yeah, we've got, this, we've got this a times b to the 0, which if I take the natural log over here, on the right-hand side of that equation, natural log of a times b to the 0. Well, b to the 0 is just 1 in the first place, right? So we can just get rid of that. We have natural log of a on this side. Um, but then on the left-hand side, what's the natural log of 0? Yeah, natural log of zero is undefined. Um, so that presents us actually with a practical problem um, in question five. Um, no matter how hard we try, we can do all right with these other two points. Natural log of three is equal to, when I take the natural log of a times b to the first, what I'm going to get is natural log of a plus one times natural log of b. And that's totally fine. And then likewise, the third equation, natural log of seven, is going to be natural log of a plus 2 times the natural log of b. So I end up with these two equations, which are totally fine. But the first equation, because of the natural log of 0 um, being undefined, there's not really anything we can do uh, with that. Um, you'll, in fact, one of the ways that that shows up is you know, these exponential functions, y equals a times b to the x, it is literally impossible for those functions to pass through the origin, 0, 0, unless a is equal to 0, which makes the whole function identically 0. Um, as long as a is not equal to 0, and b is not equal to 0, I suppose, um, then it's going to be impossible for us to get this function to pass through 0, 0. So this I have to apologize for, because it's a difficulty that I didn't foresee when I wrote this problem. Um, what you could do, I suppose, is you could just throw out this data point and just forget about this first equation. If you forget about the first equation, this leaves you with a linear system. And the linear system now is not in the variables a and b, but it's in the variables natural log a and natural log b. So what we've essentially done is we've introduced some new variables. Let's call them capital A and capital B. And then a little b. So that what we really have is this system. which now is a linear system as advertised. a plus b is equal to natural log 3. a plus 2b is equal to natural log 7. You can then do the work to solve this for capital A and capital B. You get whatever you get. And then to find original a and original b, what do you have to do? Go back. Go back. So little a is going to be e to the big A. Little b is going to be e to the big B. Um, and that will get you the, the A plus B, uh, sorry, the A and the B, which give you the equation of best fit. So I guess it's a, it's a two-part issue. Um, the first part of the issue is that sometimes, if you have a family of functions which is not in the beginning a vector space, if you transform your data, you get it into a fashion where you do now have a vector space um, of functions to work with. Um, and you can solve the resulting linear system. In this case, you can actually find an exact solution um, because you end up with two equations and two unknowns. It's no longer overspecified if we strike that first data point. Um, and then you just have to translate back to the original. So the first issue was just the issue of taking the log to turn this multiplication into addition and the exponentiation into multiplication to make this a linear system. The second issue was the problem with the one data point that we couldn't use because we don't have a natural log of zero. Um, and that one I didn't foresee ahead of time, so my apologies for that. And you have my permission to strike that data point uh, for this example. <laughs>